Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's live stream. Uh, so if you're just arriving, please make sure to say hello in the comments section. Uh, we already have one person who got here early, it looks like. Hello. And uh, everyone else, please just uh, drop a comment just to say hello and maybe tell me where you're from or how you're feeling today. So while we wait for everyone to arrive, let me tell you what we are going to do today. So uh, earlier this week or last week, uh, we made a post asking for your questions. So uh, asking, hey, put a question below uh, and maybe you will be featured in the next live stream. So today I am going to go through and answer some of your questions. Many questions I went through and typed a response to, we went through and typed responses to, uh, but some of them we're going to highlight today and I'm gonna answer some of your guys' questions. So uh, even if you didn't ask the question, I think these are all very good questions that we can all together learn something from. So, oh my gosh, look at all these hellos coming in. Hi everyone, thank you so much for letting me know that you're here. Um, so cool. Hi, hello, good to see you. Uh, is that Ali? Hi, hello, welcome to today's live stream. Uh, so what we're going to do is begin. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone saying hello from YouTube and from Facebook. So cool to see you guys here. Okay, let's go ahead and I'm going to share my screen in just a second. Okay, guys, just hold on. Um, okay, so let me just share my screen with you. And just a second, let me choose my window. And here we go. Okay, guys, so you should be able to see my screen. And uh, so welcome to the live stream today. Um, as I mentioned, let me get my, oh, sorry guys, let me get my pen ready. Um, as I mentioned, today I am going to answer the questions that you have asked. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to look at 10 questions today and let's begin with question number one. So here's our question number one, Thor from Cambodia. And uh, this person wants to ask, are the following phrases, speak out loud, speak loudly, and speak aloud, are they grammatically correct? And do they mean uh, something different or do they mean the same thing? So first, let me answer your correction, or your, your first question, are these grammatically correct? Yes. All of these phrases are grammatically correct, but they uh, are a little bit different. So first, let's take a look at the phrases speak out loud and speak aloud. Both of these have the same meaning. These terms mean to say what you're thinking, right? Just to speak. So saying speak or speak out loud or speak aloud just means uh, similar to just saying speak right, or talk or say something. So we can use these uh, interchangeably. This, they have the same meaning. Speak loudly. So here we have the adverb loudly, which is modifying our verb speak. So what this means is this is how we speak. Speak loudly means to raise the volume of your voice. So for example, maybe I have a student who is speaking very quietly, I might say, can you please speak loudly? This means they raise the volume of their voice. Please speak loudly. So these, there is a subtle, small difference between these two. Speak out loud and speak aloud just means to say what you're thinking. Speak loudly means to turn up the volume of what you're saying. Okay, let's go to question number two. 
Question number two is from Didi on Facebook. And Didi asked, what is the difference between could, would, should, might, can, and must? And thank you so much for your help. Well, you're welcome. And I hope that uh, this answer helps you. So these are all modal verbs. These are a type of verb in English. And let me tell you a quick summary of what all these mean. Can is used to talk about possibility, general truths, asking for permission, and ability. So possibility, uh, we might say something like, I can play guitar, right? Uh, or, or I'm sorry, that's ability. Possibility, uh, I might ask something like, uh, can you uh, hang out with me this weekend? General truths. Uh, you can see the moon at night, right? A general fact. Asking permission. Um, can I go, uh, maybe a student would ask something like, can I go to the bathroom? Asking permission. And ability, that's what I meant to say first. I can play guitar. I can uh, uh, surf very well. So this is how we use can. Can uh, is also used, this is not a conditional, and we will talk about that in a moment. So next is may. May is used for possibility, probability, and desire. So for example, possibility and probability, we're talking about uh, what could or might happen. So I could say something like, uh, you may see um, a shooting star tonight, right? It's possible or it's probable. You may, right? Similar to might. You may, you might. There is a chance, there is a possibility or a probability. We can also use may in a little bit of an un, uh, not, not so typical or not normal way, but we do hear it in English, which is to wish someone well or to show a desire. For example, I might say something like, may you have a uh, happy holiday, right? So I have a desire and I'm expressing that desire, may you have a happy holiday. So we can also use may to express desire or give well wishes. Next is should. So should is used for advice and suggestions. So for example, you should do your homework right? This is some advice. You should do it. Or uh, suggestions, maybe you're asking, what should I do this weekend? Oh, uh, I think you should go see a movie. So should is used for advice and suggestions. Could can be used to talk about possibility in the past, polite requests, conditional sentences, and abilities. Uh, so let's first take a look at polite requests. Possibility in the past in conditional sentences we'll talk about uh, in a moment and we'll talk about it more in a future question. So a polite request. We can use can to ask uh, for permission or for a request. Can I, can you, hey can you get that pencil for me? But if we want to be more polite we would start with could. Could you get that pencil for me? Um, so we can use it to make a polite request. We also use could for conditionals and talking about possibilities in the past. Uh, so a conditional would be something like, if I could travel anywhere, I would go to Spain. So could. And also ability or uh, I'll say possibility also in the present. Maybe you ask, uh, what could I do? Well, you could do this. Or he could play basketball very well when he was young. So we use could in all of these many, many ways. Next, let's take a look at might. Uh, so might we use to talk about any possibilities in the past, present, or future. He might have done something in the past. He might do something now, or he might do something in the future. Might and may are similar and again mean that there is a small chance, maybe 50% chance of something happening if we use it in that way. I may go see my friend or I might go see my friend. Similar meaning. 
Uh, next is wood. So wood is also a conditional, and we're going to talk about conditionals very soon. We can use would to ask for permission or make polite requests, just like we can with could. So I would say for politeness, normal sentence, maybe asking a friend, can you get a pencil for me? Maybe low, formal, not, not, not rude, but not very polite. Could you get the pencil for me? A little more polite. Would you please get the pencil for me? Very polite. So we can use would to ask very politely uh, how to do something, for someone to do something, or in conditional sentences. So in that same example, if I could travel anywhere, I would. So we can use it to talk about a possibility, that it, a, a conditional possibility, something not real, right? I would do this, maybe something we're imagining. If I was in this situation, I would do this. So we'll talk about that soon. And your last word was must. Must means have to. And this is used to say something is very important, necessary, or urgent. So it's not you should, right? This is also often used for st very strong advice. So you should do your homework. Just a small suggestion. You must do your homework means you have to. No choice. You must do it. So to give a command or it is important for you to do something you must. So this is a quick uh, little chart showing uh, different ways we use these modals. And I also suggest that uh, you check out our previous lives, one of our previous live streams where I did talk about words like this. Okay, let's go on to question number three. So I'm going to look at two questions and answer them at the same time. First is from Stephen. Hello, teacher Sarah. My question is, uh, how can a non-native speaker get native fluency? And then from Dawit, I am not perfect with grammar. What do you recommend? So I'm going to look at these uh, and answer them at the same time. So here, this is about fluency and grammar and fluency, right? These things kind of go together. How can I be more sound more native with my fluency and my grammar. So let me give you some advice. Make sure to, oh, first focus on communication, not perfection. So when you're working on your fluency and your grammar, perfection is not uh, going to happen maybe uh, for a long time right? Takes a lot of practice, a lot of time to really speak in the same way that a native speaker would. And um, this is true for every language, right? But that's okay. Your main focus should be communication. Does the other person understand the message you are trying to uh, say or uh, convey? Do they understand? If so, you are successfully communicating Practice and time are the two biggest things that will improve your fluency and grammar. So make sure you have a practice schedule and stick to it. Uh, there's a saying in English, if you don't use it, you lose it. So if you are studying, uh, let's say you're studying vocabulary or grammar or anything like this, and then you just don't have a schedule or you don't really use it and speak it and practice it, you will forget, right? I'm sure uh, if you're watching, there have been words you have learned and then you didn't use them or you didn't use the grammar and then, oh, what? Oh, I don't remember. So make sure to stick to a schedule, even if it's just five minutes a day or a couple times a week, that's better than nothing. Just be consistent with your practice. It's also important to keep it fun. So do not give yourself a very heavy schedule if you don't if you if you uh, don't like that, and if you don't like to study grammar or you don't like to memorize vocabulary, find a different way watch TV shows, listen to podcasts, read uh, song lyrics. If maybe you really like music, try to watch some videos or listen to some things in English. Make sure to keep it fun. Uh, this is going to make practice a lot easier, more interesting. So this means you're going to improve more 
uh, faster and it will have a long-term effect because you're enjoying learning. So remember, fun methods plus practice plus time equals better fluency in grammar. So things begin to sound right because you have listened and practiced and listened and practiced over time. So this means that now you can just begin to hear, oh, maybe I said uh, she should done instead of she should have done. Oh, I, I hear that that doesn't sound right. Hmm, what do I need to change? So how to become more fluent and have better grammar, practice, time, consistent schedule, and keep it fun. Okay, question number four. So this question is from Abdel. Can I learn English without studying grammar by listening or reading? So I think this is a very interesting question. And my answer to you is yes, you certainly can. You can acquire grammar over time as you become more and more used to reading and using the language. So just think about your native language. Uh, for example, of course, my native language is English. But I, when I was a child, uh, when I was one years old, two years old, three years old, I never studied the grammar of my language, right? Not until I was in school later. So uh, how did I learn grammar? Well, I learned it from speaking and listening and reading and writing and all these things. And then later I learned the names of those rules. So yes, you certainly can acquire or gain the grammar, learn it without studying it directly. But this takes, again, a lot of time, a lot of practice, and can be more challenging if you are not in an English environment where people are speaking English to you and the signs are in English and you're using it a lot. That makes acquiring it a lot easier. If you're just doing it on your own, it is more challenging but possible. So it's possible, but it is very useful to know some basic grammar rules. This will help you understand better what you are reading and listening to. So maybe, for example, you have not studied irregular verbs, uh, things like saw and ran. So if you come across something and, oh, I, I thought that ED was passed. What's happening? What's saw? Does it mean like a tool? What does this mean? If you see something confusing and you're trying to do this acquire, acquire grammar approach, make sure to look it up. You will probably learn some simple grammar rules, uh, which can help your understanding. Okay, question number five. Franco from Madagascar, what does take it for granted mean? Excellent question, Franco. So let's talk about this very common phrase. To take something for granted means to not appreciate something that is actually very beneficial or good for you. For example, if I said, you take your friend for granted, this means you do not realize how great your friend is and you do not appreciate them enough. Maybe I see you with your amazing friend and you just, oh, I'm going to cancel plans or I don't know. You don't treat them very well, but they are a very good friend to you. I might say you take your friend for granted. You don't appreciate them enough. This is a really common way we hear it. Uh, this phrase, don't take it for granted. This means, so it could be anything. Don't take your job, your education, your skills, your family, your school, your hometown, anything. Don't take it for granted. This means don't forget how important or good or special whatever it is. Don't take it for granted means don't forget to appreciate it. Don't forget to be grateful for it. And one more, uh, I might say also someone can take you for granted. She takes me for granted. She does not appreciate me enough or doesn't realize how much I do for her. She takes me for granted. So take it for granted. We can really replace this with a person, any noun, right? Person, place, thing. Take something for granted. Something or someone for granted means it's very good, but you do not appreciate it. But you should. You're taking it for granted. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, next question six. So here we are. Uh, is third conditional often used in conversation? So this one I did answer, but we're going to answer again. And I also want to address uh, your, your question here. I'm confused between second and third conditional. So um, I did do a video, a, a live stream a little while back about all the conditionals, zero, first, second, and third. But it can be confusing. This is a higher level grammar point and a, a higher level language point in English. So let's go over it one more time. So first, is third conditional often used in conversation? Yes, third conditional is used to talk about unreal things in the past that we cannot change. So this means we're often talking about things we regret or wish we could have done differently. For example, here's an example of a sentence with third conditional. If you had told me it was your birthday, I would have bought you a present. I can't change this. I cannot go back in time and uh, have you tell me it was your birthday. So this is, if this thing were different in the past, I would have done something different in the past, right? Can't change. Can't change and it's only in the past. It is used often to talk about anything in the past we wish had been different. Uh, so we might use this with, at work. Oh, if I had known that student was having a bad day, I would have been more kind. Um, so any, any, anything like this, where if the past had been different, I would have done something different in the past. So it is used often and it's useful to know. So let's take a look at second versus third conditional. Second conditional is used to talk about something improbable or unlikely or hypothetical or imaginary situations. And here's the key in the future not the past. So for example, if I had a million dollars, I would travel the world. This is second conditional. If I could, if I had, I would. Second conditional in the future, right? And unreal, improbable, unlikely, right? I probably will not ever have a million dollars. So I'm just imagining this hypothetical situation. Oh, if I had, if this were true, I would do this at, at some future time. So the key point here is this is an imagined thing in the future. If, uh, if I could travel anywhere, I would travel to Spain. This is another example of second conditional. In the future, if I could, I would. If I had, I would. Future imagined situation that is not likely to happen. Um, in the, li the live stream about this, I gave an example of if I were the president, I would da, 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 da. Unlikely, right? I will probably never be the president, but if I were, I would do this. Some uh, imagined hypothetical situation. Third condition, third conditional, as we see over here as well, is used to talk about an impossible change because it's only in the past and we cannot change the past. And here's another example. If I had known you were busy, I would have made other plans. If I had known in the past you were busy, in the past, I would have made other plans. All in the past. So remember, third conditional, past thing that I wish had changed or had been different, all in the past. Second conditional is unlikely things we imagine uh, doing or what we would do at some future time. Okay, let's go to one of our questions from YouTube. So here, um, the username is Lost Zinc. Hi, I'm from Thailand. My questions are how to or how to use a gerund and how to use these single quotations in in sentences. Thank you so much. You are so sweet. Thank you. You are so sweet. Thank you for your compliment. And let me go ahead and answer your two questions here. So, uh, gerunds are words that are formed with verbs but act as nouns. This is a little complicated, but when you see some examples, hopefully it helps. So an easy way to spot a gerund is every gerund is a verb plus ing. 
So gerunds maintain some verb-like properties, even though they act as nouns. Like a verb, they can take a direct object and can be modified with an adverb. For example, here's our gerund drinking, drinking a pint. Here the direct object is pint, so can, it functions similarly to a verb. Driving erratically. So here driving is modified with an adverb erratically. So here we have our gerund and acting like a verb modified by an adverb. Or regularly visiting the hospital. Visiting is modified by regularly and has a direct object, the hospital. Okay, a little confusing. So let's go ahead and look at some more ways we can use gerunds. So here we have a helpful chart and we see uh, running is the gerund we're looking at and what are the different ways we can use them? So first we can use them as the subject of a verb. For example, running is a good way to explore. So here, running is the gerund, is is our verb. So running is the subject of our verb. Running is a good way to explore. It can also be the object of a verb. He likes running. Here, likes is our verb and our gerund running acts as a noun in this sentence. Just like I could say he likes games. He likes playing games. They're playing as a gerund. He likes running. Here, running is the gerund. We can also use them as, an, as the object of a preposition. I am thinking of running. So here we have our verb am, right? I am thinking of running. So running is our gerund here, the object of a preposition. And also as a subject complement. So here we're renaming the subject. My new hobby is running. Uh, and this is going to lead us very well into our next question, which is when do we use to plus verb ing, which is also uh, something we can do with gerund sometimes. Okay, so these are gerunds. And I think this is something we can do a whole future video about because they can be a little confusing. Uh, so I hope that I gave you a useful answer for now. And uh, in the future, don't be surprised if you see a longer video uh, going over this very interesting grammar point. Okay, and part two of your question was when to use the singular quotation marks, right? Not the double, but the single. So we use singular quotation marks for quotations within a quotation. Here's an example. The news reporter said, all of the stores on the block have burned down. One shop owner screamed, I cannot believe this is happening as the gulf flames engulfed her store. So this is a quote, right? I'm telling what the news reporter said and the news reporter is quoting someone else. So when it's a quote within a quote, a quotation within a quotation, we use the single uh, quotation mark. So you see this a lot when you're reading a book, for example, and uh, a character is speaking and they are telling what someone else said, it'll be in single quotations. Here's another example. Jason told Mark, I saw Cynthia the other day and she said, I'm really looking forward to Mark's graduation. Okay, so here uh, Jason is speaking and he says what Cynthia said. So we have this interesting thing here where we have the end of our single quotation and the end of our double quotation. So we end up having three marks at the end there. Uh, so anytime we close the quote, if it comes at the end of a sentence, yeah, we can do it like that too. The other way is quotations within a headline. So a news headline, newspaper or online or on TV. For example, the president urges, don't worry, America. So this is a headline and this is something the president said. So we would use a single quotation in the headline. I did it for my kids, says heroic mom. So she said something, but because it's a headline, we're using single quotations. And candidate promises no more taxes. Again, a quote, but it's in a headline, so we use single quotations. So quotations within a quotation and quotations within a headline. So I hope this helped. And now let's move on to question number eight. So uh, here we have another question from YouTube from Prirana. 
After to, when does verb plus ing happen? So let me tell you, using to plus ing, uh, verb ing is unusual in English because normally after to, we use the base form of the verb. This is called the infinitive form, like to run, to walk, to go. I am going to go to the store. I am planning to run uh, later this evening. So usually it's the infinitive, to and in the base form. But there are some exceptions. One of those exceptions can happen with gerunds, but let's take a look at the most common verbs uh, we use when we, when we do this. Confess or admit to doing something, to doing something. So for example, uh, I could give a sentence like, she admitted to stealing my uh, necklace. Okay, so here, because we're using the word admit, she admitted to stealing my necklace or she confessed to stealing my necklace. We can use it with oppose or object, which means disagree to doing something. I oppose to doing something or I object to doing something means I don't want to, I disagree. So for example, I object to um, raising taxes. I don't agree with that. I oppose to raising, I am opposed to raising taxes. Uh, so here also, we can use uh, to plus the ing form. A very common way is when we talk about being dedicated, devoted, or committed to doing something. So let's say um, I am very passionate about helping animals. I might say I am dedicated to helping animals. I am devoted to helping animals or I am committed to helping animals. So here again, we use that uh, IN2 plus the ING form. Okay, let's see our next ones. To be used to, to be accustomed to, or to be adjusted to doing something. So uh, we hear it very commonly with used to or accustomed to, which have a very similar meaning. I am used to waking up early. So here we use to, used to waking up early early. Um, and this often is why, why these verbs, why this? Because confess to, admit to, object to, be dedicated to, be used to, all these things, we need to. It's not um, that we're saying really that it's just two plus ing. It's really that we have a verb plus two that work as one phrase, and then we add verb plus ing. So it's uh, a little bit different than just the base form. We can also use it with phrasal verbs, which we have a great series on, phrasal verbs, like look forward to doing something or get around to doing something. And again, it's because look forward to, get around to, these work as their own uh, verb phrases. So uh, we, the to is a part of that. I look forward to seeing my friend tomorrow. I'm, I'll get around to writing that letter next week. Okay, so these are some of the most common exceptions when we do use that two plus ing form. Okay, and our last uh, question like this is question number nine. So here, what is the difference in the pronunciation of these words? So I'm gonna go through them one by one. So this is Gilma uh, from Facebook, and let me go ahead and show you how to pronounce these. So let's start with this word. So here we have our R sound in the middle. The RL can be a little tricky. So here the pronunciation is world. World. It's almost like three sounds. We have were, ol, d, world. World. Really get that earl in there. That can be a hard uh, sound depending on your um, native language. So, but here, listen and practice with me as often as you need, world, were, ul, d, okay? Next, we have a sound here that sounds like, uh. This word is wood, wood, uh, wood. So not world, wood. 
And next, word. So here, no L, right? Similar, world, just word, word. So these three, very similar, world, would, word. A little similar, yeah? And the next two are who and whose. So here, this word, this S-E has a Z sound, whose. So let's go through them one more time together. World, would, word, who, whose. I hope that helps. Okay, the last thing I'm going to talk about, many of you asked questions about how to improve different skills. How can I improve my listening? How can I improve my English skills like a native speaker? How can I improve my speaking? How can I improve my pronunciation? How can I improve faster? Many of your questions were about this. So I'm going to give you all some general advice about how to improve your English skills. So let's start with we're going to do speaking and listening and then reading and writing. So how can you improve your speaking and listening? I'm going to tell you five ways. So how can you improve your English speaking and English listening? Number one, do it often. So this goes back to what I said earlier about having a schedule and practicing regularly. Do it often. So maybe you're thinking, and I did see some comments like, I don't have anyone to practice conversation with, or I don't have anyone to practice my speaking with. If you don't have anyone to practice speaking with, you can practice self-talk. So for example, uh, maybe this means just describing things that you see or talking to yourself about things you're doing throughout the day. Oh, I'm going to make dinner and then I'm going to um, watch a movie and da da da. You can self-talk or even look through your phone at some pictures you have taken recently and try to describe them out loud. Uh, also, if you if you do or don't have someone to practice speaking with, you can imitate or copy native speakers on your favorite shows and YouTube channels. This is a great way to practice anytime. Uh, th and this is speaking. This is practicing your speaking. So listening to watching a show you like or a YouTube channel that you like or a new YouTube channel in English about a topic that you really enjoy. Listen, pause, and repeat. Imitate their pronunciation. And you can imitate mine as well. For listening, it is very helpful to use subtitles while you watch things so you can read and listen at the same time. There are even uh, uh, things you can use to show two uh, subtitles at the same time, your native language and English at the same time for Netflix even. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll link that later, but use subtitles so you can read and listen at the same time. This will help you hear the, the way that, and understand the way that English speakers talk. So last week, last week we talked about linked sounds. This can make it very difficult to understand. This is, this makes listening to English difficult, but if you're reading at the same time, you can become a better listener because you can read what you are hearing. And this is very helpful. And also for your speaking, purposefully practice your pronunciation. This is a question uh, I get a lot. How do I improve my pronunciation? Purposefully improve. There are, or purposefully practice. There are many great resources online. And I'll just show you one. So this is called thesoundofenglish.com. And here's something about the V or B sound, which could be difficult for Spanish speakers. So you'll hear for example, what the, these two words, bowel and vowel, you see what the difference is between them, what, how to pronounce them, and then you get some drilling practice with sounds, words, and sentences. So if you want to improve your pronunciation, there are so many websites uh, that you can see a, a diagram. How do I, where, where do I put my tongue and my teeth? What do I do? How do I make this sound? 
and where you can drill. So this is just one example, thesoundofenglish.com. You can also just look up how to pronounce da da da. And it's helpful to focus on the phonetic sound. Yes, you can practice pronouncing words, but often maybe there are certain sounds in the words that you have a hard time with. Really practice those. Okay, and last, how to improve your reading and writing. Again, do it often. Read often and write often. For reading, it's important to read content you enjoy. So uh, if you don't like reading the, the news or you don't like reading textbooks, don't read those. It can be helpful to read familiar stories. So I love Harry Potter. It's always the example I give. And I've read it in English many times. So when I want to study another language, I try to read Harry Potter in that language because I am so familiar with the story, it's easy for me to understand, easier for me to understand what uh, is happening and what they're trying to say. For writing, it's helpful to keep a journal. Write about your daily life or whatever topic you want to improve on. So if you want to improve on your uh, the way you speak about a hobby or the way you speak about world events, write about it. This will help your speaking and vocabulary development too, because as you're writing, you have more time to think about what you say. And the more you practice your writing, and the more you really think about what you want to say, the easier it is to speak, and the easier it is to quickly uh, share your ideas or what you've been writing about, talk about your daily life, or the easier it is to talk about other topics. Writing is very, very important. And if you are not writing, you should definitely start today. Also write in different formats. You can write in the comment section and in online groups. You can write about your day in a journal. For example, write a story. It doesn't have to be perfect. It is about practice and patience. So I hope this, uh, this advice helps you. Thank you so much for asking your questions. Um, we will do things like this in the future. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, so we are going to, uh, I'll continue to take questions. We'll do another live stream like this in the future. Uh, and that is it for today. So um, thank you everyone so much for listening. Thank you for watching. I hope you all have a wonderful day and I'll see you next week for next week's live stream.